During the film, Donnie speaks to his science teacher after class about a very unique subject, time travel. He has more than a few questions after things in his world start to go very sideways in terms of logic and reality, and luckily, his professor has a book he can check out, The Philosophy of Time Travel by Roberta Sparrow. Roberta Sparrow used to be a nun and a teacher at the school way back when it was more of a private Catholic establishment, and she still lives in town but is known by another name, Grandma Death. Sparrow can usually be seen standing in the middle of the road or continuously checking her mail, always in a trance outside the house. During the theatrical release of the film, we never find out what's in the book. None of it is read out loud to us, we don't get chunks of pages that tell us anything, and Donnie doesn't actually discuss the contents with anyone in ways that give us real clues. The closest we get to what's inside are the statements made on how time travel should work from Donnie's teacher, who has read Roberta Sparrow's book. The contents of the philosophy of time travel are actually the full cipher key to the entire movie, and while the original cut of the film doesn't have any information from that book, the director's cut has pages inserted at key points, with some excerpts overlapping scenes that are connected to what the excerpts teach us. Without knowing what comes in the philosophy of time travel, a viewer would be stuck trying to navigate the world of Donnie Darko with extreme difficulty, and attempting to break its mystery would be a task that very few people could come close to doing. Even with the director's cut, it takes a bit of thinking to apply the knowledge, and then even further mental grinding to wrap your head around it all. So, what key passages did we need from the philosophy of time travel? Beyond seeing them in flashes during the director's cut of the film, you'd also need to open up the DVD extra containing them in full. Once you have all of what we're given, the passages fall into place and the film begins to make sense. We're going to take it step by step, applying these pieces as their points come up. First, let's establish the biggest need-to-know fact about the Donnie Darko story. The primary universe is fraught with great peril. War, plague, famine, and natural disaster are common. Death comes to us all. The fourth dimension of time is a stable construct, though it is not impenetrable. Incidents when the fabric of the fourth dimension becomes corrupted are incredibly rare. If a tangent universe occurs, it will be highly unstable, sustaining itself for no longer than several weeks. Eventually, it will collapse upon itself, forming a black hole within the primary universe capable of destroying all existence. When a tangent universe occurs, those living nearest to the vortex will find themselves at the epicenter of a dangerous new world. Artifacts provide the first sign that a tangent universe has occurred. If an artifact occurs, the living will retrieve it with great interest and curiosity. Artifacts are formed from metal, such as an arrowhead from an ancient Mayan civilization, or a metal sword from medieval Europe. Artifacts returned to the primary universe are often linked to religious iconography, as their appearance on Earth seems to defy logical explanation. In the film, the passage concerning artifacts being created appears over the early scenes of the jet engine being removed from Donnie's house after it fell through his room. We see the jet engine and the men who came to take it away. This jet engine, a big, metal object that surely would have killed anyone who was under it when it fell, is the artifact. An artifact is always made of metal, and Roberto Sparrow cites an arrowhead and a sword as examples, objects made for the purpose of killing. The existence of an artifact is a sign that a tangent universe has been created. We have left the natural timeline of the world known as the primary universe and entered a highly unstable course. This tangent universe will not last more than a few weeks say about 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, and 6 seconds to be precise. Once the tangent universe becomes unstable enough, it will form a black hole so powerful it can destroy that world and the primary universe, which is exactly what we see happening at the end of the film. The movie mainly takes place in a tangent universe created by something that corrupted the fabric of the fourth dimension. Everyone is knocked off the course of the primary universe into the tangent, and we're left with a big metal gen engine as the artifact made by the event. Frankler's Donnie out of bed to tell him the Tangent Universe, their current world, will be destroyed in a matter of weeks. Why does he tell Donnie? Because Donnie is what's referred to as the Living Receiver. The Living Receiver is chosen to guide the artifact into position for its journey back to the primary universe. No one knows how or why a receiver will be chosen. The Living Receiver is often blessed with fourth dimensional powers. These include increased strength, telekinesis, mind control, and the ability to conjure fire and water. The living receiver is often tormented by terrifying dreams, visions, and auditory hallucinations during his time within the Tangent Universe. Those surrounding the living receiver, known as the Manipulated, will fear him and try to destroy him. 
In the film, Donnie manages to pull off at least two examples of fourth dimensional powers before the confusing ending, incredible strength, and the ability to conjure fire. The axe he brings to school is used to break through a water main, which is a difficult task already, but it also ends up buried in the head of the statue outside. Later, he breaks into the home of Jim Cunningham, pours gasoline everywhere, and lights it on fire without striking a match or using a lighter. Both of these events also take place while Donnie is under the influence of Frank the Bunny, who by the end of the film is revealed to be another high school student in a costume that Donnie shoots in the head after Gretchen is run over. Gretchen and Frank's deaths in the Tangent Universe puts them in the position of what Roberta Sparrow calls the Manipulated Dead. The Manipulated Dead are more powerful than the Living Receiver. If a person dies within the Tangent Dimension, they are able to contact the Living Receiver through the Fourth Dimensional Construct. The Fourth Dimensional Construct is made of water. The Manipulated Dead will manipulate the Living Receiver using the Fourth Dimensional Construct. The Manipulated Dead will often set an insurance trap for the Living Receiver to ensure that the artifact is returned safely to the primary universe. If the insurance trap is successful, the Living Receiver is left with no choice but to use his fourth dimensional power to send the artifact back in time into the primary universe before the black hole collapses upon itself. During the film, Frank is the guiding force behind all of the supernatural events. As one of the Manipulated Dead, he can move around in the timeline of the Tangent Universe, appearing when and where he wants. He's able to manipulate Donnie using the fourth dimensional construct made of water, which Roberta Sparrow illustrates with two images, showing that it comes from the center of the chest. The big flowing translucent coils that came out of people before Donnie experienced it himself? That's the fourth dimensional construct, created by Frank to guide Donnie on his path. First, Frank shows Mr. Darko with the construct flowing in the exact direction he's going to walk. This has Donnie believe he's seeing some kind of indication of the future laid out in a visual way, making it hard for him to resist following the construct that emerges from his chest moments later, leading to a gun. The very gun he later uses to shoot Frank, ensuring he can become one of the manipulated dead and guide everything else into place. Further acts of ensuring he dies involves leading Donnie to the whiteboard on the fridge with the construct, which has an important message. Frank was here, went to get beer. He then sees others with the construct again, leading them on their path to underline once again to Donnie that the construct is a guide. He needs to use the clue he was just given on the whiteboard instead of ignoring it, because the construct led him there. Donnie then receives visions from Frank that result in him leaving the house, setting up the situation in which he then meets and kills him. Now, about those other people with the construct. The fourth dimensional construct works on a layer of time, which means Frank is highlighting the timeline of a person using the construct, but he may have a direct hand in determining their path according to this passage from Sparrow's book. The manipulated living are often the close friends and neighbors of the living receiver. They are prone to irrational, bizarre, and often violent behavior. This is the unfortunate result of their task, which is to assist the living receiver in returning the artifact to the primary universe. The manipulated living will do anything to save themselves from oblivion. Frank and Gretchen, as members of the manipulated dead, have great power over what happens in their environment, including influence over the manipulated living and even greater power over the living receiver, Donnie. Guiding timelines to show off the construct at just the right time would probably be under their realm of ability, and even if it wasn't, this passage explains a lot about what occurs in the film regarding the behavior of people around Donnie and Gretchen. Gretchen is set up as the love interest for Donnie at each opportunity available. When she first arrives in the classroom, the teacher puts her next to Donnie. When Donnie is given the idea to flood the school from Frank, it creates the situation in which Gretchen is harassed by two guys and asks Donnie to walk her home. Donnie asks her to go out and she automatically says yes, which seems very strange for an awkward first encounter. Then it takes a long time for her to show him any sort of affection, and any kind of major affection only happens a few hours before her death when she has the last possible moment to make that happen. Gretchen plays her role in making sure Donnie saves the world as much as Frank does, guiding him into what's known as the insurance trap. The manipulated dead will set an insurance trap. The living receiver must ensure the fate of all mankind. If the insurance trap is successful, the living receiver is left with no choice but to use his fourth dimensional power to send the artifact back in time into the primary universe before the black hole collapses upon itself. The events that take place at Roberta Sparrow's house on October 30th are the insurance trap, leaving Donnie with nothing left to do except save the world. Gretchen, the only girl he's ever been with, is killed. Donnie murders another person directly in front of a witness he lets go, and he knows that time has run out. All month long, he's had to stare down the fate he knows is coming, and now has no more reason to dodge it. If he stays, it's for nothing. 
But why would Donnie be afraid to save the primary universe besides losing what he built with Gretchen if she had lived? Because Donnie has had time to read all of the philosophy of time travel, gaining a full sense of what will happen when he resets things and what it means. And the writing on the wall is not good. We can even catch a portion of it ourselves in the passage about after effects of fixing the tangent universe. Those who do remember the journey are often overcome with profound remorse for their regretful actions buried within their dreams, the only physical evidence buried within the artifact itself, all that remains from the lost world. Ancient myth tells us of the Mayan warrior killed by an arrowhead that had fallen from a cliff where there was no army, no enemy to be found. We are told of the medieval knight mysteriously impaled by a sword he had not yet built. The passage directly parallels the previous mention of arrowheads and swords describing the creation of artifacts. Artifacts are formed from metal, such as an arrowhead from an ancient Mayan civilization or a metal sword from medieval Europe. We're given the example of the artifact, and then later told those artifacts ended up killing someone in the primary universe, seemingly for no logical reason. No army or enemy on a cliff, no way for a knight to be killed by a sword he hadn't built. Are you seeing it yet? Maybe this final piece will reveal what Donnie really knows. If the insurance trap is successful, the living receiver is left with no choice but to use his fourth dimensional power to send the artifact back in time into the primary universe before the black hole collapses upon itself. These three passages together reveal the truth. The artifact is described as a metal object, like an arrow or a sword. The end result of Sparrow's example for a tangent universe being fixed is a mind warrior killed by a mystery arrow or a knight falling on a sword he hadn't yet built the artifacts. And the living receiver, in order to fix the tangent universe, must send the artifact back in time into the primary. Sending the artifact back in time, and an artifact taking the form of a sword that kills a knight who hadn't yet built it, but was clearly made by him. This is the key. When Donnie fixes the tangent universe, he rips the jet engine off of a plane flying overhead, the plane that carries his mother and sister coming back from his sister's dance competition. Donnie needs to send the artifact back in time to the primary universe using telekinesis which he can use as a living receiver. The problem is that the artifact, the jet engine that crashed into the house, was already taken by the government. So, how do you reconcile the issue by grabbing a different jet engine? You don't. Because it's the same jet engine. The artifact sword that killed the knight was made by that knight in Roberta's example, but it was a sword he hadn't built yet. That sword came from the future, and it came from the Tangent Universe. The future in the Tangent Universe. It came through the portal, landed in the primary, and killed the knights. This is a direct parallel to Donnie's situation. The jet engine that crashed on his house was the same one he pulled off the plane. The artifact came from the future. Its point of origin was the plane as it flew under the black hole. Donnie may not have built that jet engine, but just like the knight with his sword from the future, the object had his touch on it before he experienced its impact in the primary universe. Donnie understands what Roberta Sparrow's book is teaching him, and he's afraid of being crushed to death by the jet engine if he fixes the world, just like the knight with his sword. Not only because of the example Sparrow wrote, but because a primary universe that's been fixed means Frank isn't necessary, so he'll no longer be there to lure him out of bed before that jet engine comes down. Donnie will still be sleeping unless he's going to be lucky enough to sleepwalk again. So, that wraps up the situation at the end of the movie, when Donnie is actually killed by the gen engine. But, because this is happening for the first time in the primary universe, how can we possibly reconcile the paradox of the gen engine appearing in the tangent universe if it came from the tangent universe in the future? This is where all of the time traveling issues can become a major headache, but just follow me for a moment and we can cross that jump without pulling a mental muscle. The example provided for the entire cycle of Broken Primary Universe, Tangent Universe being created, and Tangent Universe being fixed by Roberta Sparrow goes as follows. The fourth dimension of time is a stable construct, though it is not impenetrable. Incidents when the fabric of the fourth dimension becomes corrupted are incredibly rare, but when it happens, it does create a Tangent Universe. So, the fourth dimension is the power of time itself. A corruption in time in our primary universe results in a Tangent Universe being created. We don't know what the corruption itself is, what causes it, how it happens. We just know that it does, and the second it occurs, a tangent universe takes place. In that tangent universe, everything is the same except for its position outside of the primary universe. The tangent universe is an exact duplicate, a reflection of the primary with a timeline that includes the same past and present up until that primary stopped. 
You can consider these to be two different tracks for the flow of the world with a new Tangent Universe track now running across from the primary, and the primary's flow of progress halted at the moment of corruption. Our world was frozen in time at this point in the primary universe, so we slipped off the primary track onto a tangent track where the world's timeline picks up. The tangent universe will keep on going as if nothing even happened and an artifact will appear. This is where our movie mainly takes place. At this moment, Donnie escapes the jet engine because Frank, as a manipulated dead character, went back in time and lured him away, as Donnie has been chosen as the living receiver who will put the world back onto the primary universe track. The flow of our world keeps on going along the tangent universe track for a while after it slips off of the primary, but because the tangent is unstable, the world only has a few weeks until it collapses. Donnie's task is to take the artifact and throw it into the primary universe, where he knows it's going to land exactly where it did before, but this time, Frank won't lure him out of bed because Frank's job is done. Donnie is scared of dying. He spends 28 days learning what's going on, accepts his fate at the end, grabs the jet engine with telekinesis because he has 4 dimensional powers as the living receiver, and tosses it through a wormhole into the primary universe. It goes back in time, right to the point of the corruption that knocked it off course on October 2nd, because that's where time stopped in the primary. This universe was on pause, and now the jet engine's arrival pushes the play button. It lands exactly the same way it did before, right on top of Donnie and kills him. Frank is only a manipulated dead in the Tangent universe, which is a duplicate, and the problem is now solved, so he's not around to travel back in time and lure Donnie out of bed before the engine falls. So now, we have the paradox of the jet engine appearing at all over Donnie's house in the Tangent universe when it gets thrown out of it later. This is what's confusing, because it's leaving our dimension and affecting another Donnie entirely. If this was a classic time travel story where a character receives a mystery object out of nowhere, uses it to save their life during an adventure, and then sends it to themselves in the past to make sure they can use it to save their life, we understand that. We have seen this plot before. It creates a perfect loop. The character gets the object from the future, because their future self sent it back in time, and that future self also received it by having it sent from themselves in the future, thus creating an endless loop of giving and receiving forever and ever. The problem with Donnie Darko is that his version of sending the mystery object back in time is like sending yourself a live bomb. The second you get it in the past, it blows up and immediately kills you, which means you'd never be able to send it in the first place and we're left with an impossible paradox. This is what's so difficult about Donnie Darko. He effectively did send himself a bomb. If throwing the jet engine into the primary universe fixes that tangent universe and then collapses it back into the primary, then how did the jet engine appear in the tangent universe at all? How did Donnie even survive the first round to become the living receiver? This is the big dilemma, but there is an answer, and it's all about cause and effect and securing stable time loops. In order to understand how this even works, I want you to imagine that in the tangent universe, a jet engine never even crashed into Donnie's house. Put it out of your mind. Everything else still happens exactly the same because it's a tangent universe, the powers of the fourth dimension know something went wrong and they plotted a course to fix things. Frank still happens, Gretchen still happens, the entire movie stays the same. Except for the ending, as Donnie only knows the jet engine is the artifact because it came down earlier. There's our paradox with the whole hypothetical no jet engine crashing situation. Donnie knows by the end of the movie that the artifact is the jet engine, but never saw it earlier, so he didn't learn that it was the artifact. This is literally the only problem we have in this situation. Donnie knows something he can't possibly know. This will make sense very quickly though, don't worry about that logic hole yet. Now, still keeping in mind that we're pretending the jet engine never even crashed on the house, I want you to remember the nature of the tangent universe and its relationship with the primary. For that, we have to revisit this scene in the film where Donnie is stabbing a mirror that results in a ripple effect. This is the true relationship between the two worlds. The primary is a person standing in front of the mirror, and the tangent is their reflection. Whatever the primary does, the tangent follows back. The anomaly of a corruption in the fabric of the fourth dimension resulting in our movie's plot is like the reflection suddenly walking off on its own, leaving you frozen in place. Following that analogy along the course of the movie's plot, your reflection in its mirror world misses being crushed by a falling jet engine that came from no point of origin whatsoever. It spends 28 days figuring out how to fix the world it's in, only to realize the solution is throwing a jet engine into your world, where it's going to appear directly in the space and time you were frozen, right above your house, directly above the bathroom. 
time goes right back to moving forward, and as the gen engine comes down and crushes you to death, every single thing that happens is reflected in the mirror, therefore happening to the mirror world version of you in that world. Because the world in which you were crushed is Donnie's primary universe, and the tangent universe is behind the mirror acting as a reflection, what happens in the primary must occur in the reflection that is the tangent, even if your own reflection just threw a jet engine on your head from the future in its own world. Basically, this is a story about the one and only time a person's reflection acted on its own and made something happen in our world, which, you know, was then reflected by the mirror so it happened in the reflections world as well. And this is the point at which it all comes together. Remember how we were pretending the jet engine never came down in the tangent universe and that created a logical paradox? When you realize the tangent universe is a reflection, the problem is solved. Donnie throws the jet engine out of the mirror world. It crosses into the primary universe in the past and comes down where it kills him. Because the tangent universe is a reflection, the same exact thing happens. But due to the forces of the manipulated dead at work in the tangent universe, Frank is there to lure Mirror World Donnie away from the destruction in the reflection event and ensure that later in the movie, he will be the one to throw that jet engine. This is where tangent universe Donnie gets the knowledge of the artifact. The jet engine comes down because he makes it do so for the primary universe in his future. And because Frank saves him from the reflection happening to him in that tangent, that Donnie can make this entire loop happen in the first place. Donnie learns what the artifact is so he can later get rid of it, and because he gets rid of it, he learns what the artifact is, so he can get rid of it and then learn what the artifact is, and so on, and so forth, and so on, creating a perfect, stable time loop. But even then, writer and director Richard Kelly was so smart about how he wrote Donnie Darko that he did the impossible. He actually broke the eternal time loop paradox. When you have one of these occurring in a story, your brain gets stuck on a path of going around in a ring for eternity with no way out. By stretching the time loop across two different timelines and making sure death is the result of the first successful loop, Richard Kelly solved the problem. The tangent universe where the loop would normally take place gets absorbed back into the primary, where the first half of the loop results in Donnie being killed. That's alright because it wasn't Donnie in the past who threw the jet engine, it was Donnie from another universe entirely. By collapsing that second timeline after its initial effect and making the effect happen in a different universe, the logical issues are avoided. I have never seen someone pull this off before, but Richard Kelly found out how. In a story about an eternal time loop paradox, he found out how to make the cycle happen only once and then stop, with no major repercussion. Unless you count Donnie being killed by the gen engine as a major repercussion, which is actually the whole point of the movie for Donnie as a character. He is fully aware by the end that throwing the gen engine is most likely going to kill him. If he wasn't meant to be sleepwalking naturally by the time it came down, he'd be right under it, and there would be no stopping his demise. The interesting part? Donnie actually does wake up in the primary universe, and the moment he does so and the character fly through that follows actually tie into the final piece of the philosophy of time travel that solve a mystery for us. When the manipulated awaken from their journey into the tangent universe, they are often haunted by the experience in their dreams. Many of them will not remember. Those who do remember the journey are often overcome with profound remorse for the regretful actions buried within their dreams, the only physical evidence buried within the artifact itself, all that remains from the lost world. After we go through the tunnel Donnie creates for the jet engine, we appear in his room the night of October 2nd in the primary universe, where he sits up in bed laughing. He seems oddly happy, relieved even. Donnie lays down, smiling, and turns over in bed, going to sleep. Not even a minute later, the jet engine comes down. Donnie knew what was about to happen. He knew the engine was coming because he had just woken up after having a dream of the Tangent Universe's events. Just like the characters we flew over that night are all awake shaken out of their sleep by their dreams of the Tangent Universe and everything that happened in it. Donnie was shaken out of sleep. In the first run of this night, Frank had him sleepwalking out of the house for their meeting on the golf course shortly before the jet engine came down. Before Frank summoned him, Donnie was sleeping, so a return to the primary universe where Donnie is now laughing in bed at the moment he was previously sleepwalking means he just woke up. All that went on in the tangent universe feels like a really vivid dream to him, but a dream he might know was much more. Regardless of how much he truly knows about the journey, Donnie's feelings about a lot of things have now changed, and whether a jet engine really is about to come down and kill him, 
he has accepted death. If he wanted to, he could have gotten out of bed, but he's very comfortable with his feelings and lays down, ready for whatever happens. This is why we open on the shot of the art piece on his wall after we enter the primary universe at the end. The skull in the center of the eye symbolizes that Donnie sees death ahead, but as we see next, he's not afraid. The character viewing section that comes next shows the effect of several people who were involved with Donnie waking from their dream. Each has their own unique reaction to the event, though most of them share a look of being worried. Most notable is Jim Cunningham, whose demise after being caught as a pedophile in the Tangent Universe lays heavy on him in the primary. We also see Frank after catching sight of his concept art for the Grim Reaper bunny suit. And before we see his mask, he touches the eye that Donnie shot out, remembering his death. This sequence is pretty famous among viewers, mainly for its audio. One of the most recognizable songs in modern cinema comes from Donnie Darko, the cover of Mad World by Gary Jules and Michael Andrews, which plays over the scene. Mad World works on three levels here, all of them thematic, and two of them deeply unsettling. The first layer of meaning is no surprise. Mad World, despite being hugely popular because of the Gary Jules cover, was actually made by the 80s band Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears already has a song in the film called Head Over Heels, and they're in good company with a few other examples of 80s music in Donnie Darko as the movie does take place in 1988. The second layer is deeper. For all of the songs chosen, Mad World fits amazingly well with many of Donnie Darko's themes. All around me are familiar faces. Worn out places, worn out faces, bright and early for their daily races, going nowhere, going nowhere. This is very much the way that Donnie sees the world, with nihilistic eyes and a sense that people are constantly putting up a facade. Meanwhile, he does feel hurt by the world in which he lives, expressed in the rest of the verse. Hide my head, I want to drown my sorrow. No tomorrow, no tomorrow. Then comes the eerie piece, the chorus. I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take. When people run in circles, it's a very, very mad world. Those first two lines are easily understood and their impact is heavy. The other lines are more sorrowful. Donnie can't express himself to the adults around him or even Gretchen, not in the ways that he needs to. He finds it difficult to take the situation he's in during the film, the task that lies before him, and the sense that he's saving a world that he's never truly liked. And as for people running in circles, we did just escape from an eternal time loop in a very mad world. And for our final layer of meaning, well, besides the need for a more somber song during the character flyover, have you ever considered why a cover of Mad World was chosen instead of the original recording? Think about the context of the track and its placement. We have essentially the same song, but changed in a major way, just like the primary universe. We've left where we just were and gone somewhere else that is still, in its own way, the same place. A cover song could be considered a parallel to this idea. The same thing, but now different. Donnie Darko is a film you could go on about for hours. Essays have been written about it, books have been written about it, music and film and television have all been influenced by it. There's a lot to be gained from experiencing this film and studying what it does. It touches a lot of ground and explores more than a few themes while treating you to one month in a life that you won't soon forget. The mystery of Donnie Darko may be solved, but the spell it cast remains. And, as we end this night in the theater, I leave you with this last bit of mystery. In the film, a shot is taken of a calendar on the wall for October 1988, the exact month and year in the movie. The precise layout of that month is the very same that we're experiencing this year, right now. Begins on Saturday, ends with Halloween on a Monday, and has four complete weeks in between. Every single day this month corresponds precisely to the same day by date and name in Donnie Darko. Perhaps this really was the best possible time to revisit this film. I do hope you've enjoyed our time together celebrating the start of the greatest month of the year. Feel free to let me know your thoughts on Donnie Darko, time travel, and terrifying rabbit visions in the comments below. Hit the like button if you've had a good time, and consider subscribing if you're new here for more coverage of dark, horrifying, and mysterious media. A major thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon who make it possible to cover big things like Donnie Darko, and gave me the opportunity to make this a very fun October on the channel. 
Stay around to catch the names of these awesome patrons at the end. Thanks again for joining me in the dark this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and like a jet engine crashing through your home, I'll be seeing you real soon. Sleep tight.